Um, welcome everyone to today's uh, AATN seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to have Chao Chen from Stony Brook University uh, give a talk about topological uncertainty and topological representations for biomedical images. The floor is yours, Chao. All right. Thanks, Martin. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to give a talk here. Um, to share with everyone what I have done and my past experience. Hopefully, this is helpful for the, the for the field. Um, my name is Chao Chen from Stony Brook University. Um, a little bit uh, about my background. I actually started actually doing more theoretical computation topology, more from the algorithm side. Uh, we were basically working on this homology localization problem, in which we are given a simplicial complex and a homology a specific homology class. The question is, can you find the best generator in the optimal sense. Um, and then later on, I started postdocs, plural, two postdocs, um, working on computation of person homology with Herbert. And also we applied um, a lot of uh, the techniques. Start, I started to apply this to different application fields. Um, eventually I landed on more on the biomedical image analysis as well as machine learning. And then as a faculty, I've been um, spending more time um, into the application side, uh, but I still keep my roots in like using the right topological methods and how best use them in practice. So that's the main thing. So my research thesis after years of evolving, um, right now my uh, my focus is to try to seamlessly combine all these mathematical modeling topics, constructs with machine learning, so we can benefit from both, right? So. Um, Right now, it's more about topology, but of course, uh, eventually, I want to incorporate more about geometry, dynamics, and so forth. And the idea is to incorporate those models so they can better inform machine learning methods. And meanwhile, the hope is those machine learning methods or problems can inspire better, um, um, not necessarily better, but new questions um, to challenge uh, mathematicians as well as uh, uh, algorithm designing uh, people. So a lot of methodology development of this, uh, what I'm doing is funded by NSF Career Award for doing topology-driven machine learning and also uh, several other application side uh, grants. So I will be focusing on biomedical image analysis, um, but I want to spend a little bit of time just sneaking what uh, to tell people what we have done in terms of machine learning as well in parallel. So in the machine learning, one of the major topic we did is on um, applying topological analysis to graph neural networks. So in those contexts, we've been using topological features, geometric features, meaning rigid curvature, to help um, the neural network uh, prediction. Uh, we also learned to um, uh, <laughs> right. We also um, try to develop a learning algorithm in 2022 neurops. Uh, to uh, to replace the computation of person homology because in a large graph large graph computing person homology is actually very challenging and expensive, and furthermore we have um, looked more into higher order representations. For example, looking at cycles really and cycle basis. Really yeah. uh, looking at cycles, cycle basis, and how they can be used in the learning context, and. Uh, um, instead of citing a lot of other works doing uh, relevant and similar things, I'm just citing people's. Bastian here has done a lot of work uh, in graph neural network and how to combine them with topological computation. Uh, Roland um, and Yusu and Tamo, uh, Christian Bodna and Mustafa, um, they have, as if have been all been doing um, excellent work along this direction. And it's uh, ongoing. And meanwhile, we have, uh, I, we have also uh, apply those topological methods in different other contexts for machine learning, more uh, focusing on the robustness of the learning. For example, we have done work on uh, by inspecting the topology of the decision boundary of a classifier or uh, inspecting the topology of uh, uh, data in the representation, neural network representation. We have improved the, the robustness of the, 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 uh, the classifier against uh, noise in the data. And uh, recent years, I've been looking a lot into this backdoor attack against machine, machine learning models. <laughs> Excuse me. So in those contexts, we look at the <clears throat> neural correlation between neurons and how they are uh, the topological structure arising from those contexts and identify 
some of those high persistence loops are actually indicative of the backdoor attack or some kind of uh, malicious uh, components of neural network um, and so forth. Um, so coming back to the main topic, right, namely the uh, biomedical structures. Um, so in nowadays in a lot of contexts, we have very rich, um, we, we always have those very rich medical structures, biomedical structures. Um, they are hidden in our um, in uh, animals' uh, brain and uh, uh, body, uh, in human brain, human body, in different contexts. Um, with better and better imaging quality, we are actually able to really uh, well see those uh, structures in high resolution. So the study has revealed that we can actually have a lot of interesting study, uh, discover new biomarkers, all kinds of things um, through those structures. Uh, but the question is, how do we quantify those structures? How do we extract those structures? And and it, to, in this aspect, I think um, my I have a lot of passion. I think person homology and generally topological methods can really help. So, I instead of jumping into the problem directly, I want to say a little bit about my how my research has evolved over the years. It actually has two storylines. The first storyline is how what kind of tools am I uh, interested. in? Or am I more focused on? In the very beginning, of course, person homology. Uh, we have persistent diagrams. We use them as features and, and in different contexts, right? But as time goes, I start to focus. I mean, this was actually my original PhD study um, where we talk about generators. But in practice, I start to find, find out those generators, as especially in the imaging context and, and even in learning context as well they can be very helpful if we are able to extract them properly and efficiently. Um, and then in very recently, um, I've been slowly drift into more um, like a most complex. A most complex essentially breaks down the structures into even smaller pieces. And though their combination can give us the person homology as well as topolo general topology structures, but I found they could be actually be very useful in, in, in the real world reasoning. Another story is more from the task perspective. So working on the image analysis, in, at start, we actually try to use simply threshold holding. This is a, a earlier work uh, focusing on cardiac image, uh, where we're trying to extract the fine, fine topological structures within the human heart lamp ventricles. So the idea is to threshold the images. And then if the threshold doesn't give us the right structures, we can actually extract high persistence uh, homology classes and their uh, generators and use those generators to actually force those structures to be a uh, part of the segmentation. This turns out to be very powerful and useful. But later on, we start moving into more using neural network because this kind of context only uh, uh, somehow assumes a high intensity, exactly high and low intensity give us the indication of where the structures are. But in practice, that's not as true. So you have to use common neural network and in that context, we try to preserve the topology to be correct, how to better um, segment the structures with fine topology. And that's where we introduce the topological loss in this context. And then um, all this work is more focusing on given the image and try to generate a binary mask that gave us the structure. But then uh, in recent years, I've been a little bit moving forward uh, towards this uncertainty reasoning. Uh, I will talk a little bit more, I'll definitely talk more about this uncertainty. The uncertainty is, is basically not only do we want to have these structures extracted, but also we want to say on which structure I'm more certain, on which structure I'm not sure, right? This kind of information can be very relevant and useful for downstream reasoning and analysis, okay? So as you can see, there's two, like, two different paths um, in parallel and eventually they, both of them converge, they converge to, together, which will be the main talk today. In, in namely, we use most complex and combine them with um, learning to, to actually try to predict uh, topological uncertainty. So to start with, I want to introduce uh, generally how do we handle biomedical data, in particular, this kind of fine structure data um, that can give us good motivation. So here's one pipeline we generally do. We start with a data, uh, let's say this is a one project we're working on uh, in terms of vasculature segmentation and then vasculature 
quant uh, structural uh, quantification, and eventually we try to make predictions for different clinical outcomes, right? So the idea is the morphology and topology of the vasculatures can help us uh, better predict whether a patient is going to survive or not, and so forth. So here the idea is uh, we break that into two part, uh, two steps, right? Of course, these two steps can fuse in the future, but right now we do this in two steps. The first step is annotation stage, right? Basically, given a lot of uh, chest images or a lot of um, uh, medical images, we want to segment those structures out in good quality, right? So segmentation means we want to extract those vas vasculature in 3D or in 2D, depends. And then at this step, right, we it's not clear that in the very beginning you can have a perfect uh, segmentation because if you want to have a really perfect one, you need a lot of annotation. So instead, we start with the crappy version and then slowly by uh, slowly soliciting different human input and it converts to a better quality, quality segmentation. And if we can do this for a lot of images, then we have a good collection of data. And finally, we do we extract such features out of those and then do a quantification analysis to make, uh, to make segmentation, uh, to make prediction. And of course, we want to visualize those things and they can help us improve the interpretability of the model and so forth. And this is a, a future story we're going to talk about. But in this particular um, talk, I'm going to focus on how do we extract those structures in a, in a, in a, in a good quality, right? With as, um, as, as little human input as possible, right? Of course, it's not, it's not possible without human input, but the question is how much can we do we need? So um, to start with, um, I mean, I already mentioned this earlier. So um, an image segmentation task is when we have an image and when we try to extract a binary mask, basically every pixel has a label of whether it belongs to the structure or not. And then here is like a ground truth. And then here is uh, if we train the neural network good enough, yeah, the network will basically make a prediction on every pixel. Pixel is like a location in the image, um, whether it belongs to the structure or not, zero or one, right? So here are different models uh, uh, output. And uh, we are just showing that uh, this is a ground truth, what it really looks like. We're showing that by introducing this uh, topological loss, uh, we are able to preserve the topology really well. Um, and then, um, so um, the, the basic idea is aside from the original uh, cross entropy loss, which generally was used in segmentation, actually there's other loss like dice loss and so forth. They basically compare the prediction and the ground truth at every pixel. Okay, every location. Um, here, the, the prediction is not actually necessary a segmentation. It's more like a continuous value function called likelihood function. A likelihood function basically is at every pixel, it's an intensity value between zero and one. It basically says, according to the neural network, at this location, how likely this pixel is the structure or not. Right? The, it, 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 it is based, designed to be a probability. Right? If you have this likelihood function, of course, if you just threshold it at 0 0.5, you'll get a segmentation, right? So the idea is that uh, usually when people train this neural network to make the right prediction, you make a prediction on every training data image and then compare this likelihood function with the ground truth at every location with cross entropy loss. What we do is we actually extract topological features like persistent diagram from the likelihood function and also diagram from the ground truth by treating the ground truth function as a binary value function, zero and one. So, and then just try to match the two diagrams using um, uh, what's the same distance. And then that matching or that what's the same distance basically give us a loss. And by optimizing it, essentially you are forcing this likelihood function to have a similar topology as the ground truth. And this help us to improve the network in terms of topological accuracy. So another trick that we found very useful in practice is instead of doing the topological loss over the whole image, you should generally try to crop small regions, small location patches. For every patch, you do the person homology, and then you look at the um, uh, look at its uh, inspect its uh, topology uh, in terms of loss. The idea is if you have some kind of web branch or three way branches, by adding a, a frame. I mean, formally you can talk about this as relative homology. But if you're basically adding a branch, uh, adding a frame out of the uh, branch, you can form by every branch will correspond to some kind of loops, 1D homology. This can help us in general 
uh, actually not only preserve the number of loops, but also preserve the branchiness and so forth. Um, we are not alone, again. Um, topological loss and in general, the objective function defined by precision homology and topology has been introduced and studied quite well in the field uh, during the time. Um, and then in, initially, um, 2016, uh, Gamario uh, had point out the differentiability. And then uh, Paul and Nard, um, they, um, they started uh, by applying this to a shift matching or uh, graphics context. And then we, in 2019, had a paper uh, try to use topological topic loss to regularize the decision boundary of a classifier. And there are a lot of works following. Like in recent years, there are also study more on the theoretical side from uh, Matthew and from uh, Jacob, I think, um, on the um, theoretical guarantee of the optimization with topological loss. And then um, I just want to mention this as a paper by uh, like, uh, Theo and others. Uh, they call the paper a topological uncertainty. So it's kind of relevant, but it's actually not in the sense that they are using the neural, active, neural, neural activations of a neural network to measure its quality. Um, so they call it topological uncertainty. So coming back to our problem, um, we have um, we are trying to given uh, do a segmentation of the image. But in the beginning, a lot of time we don't have any annotation, right? So we can't train the model directly. But instead, we can pre-train the model on somewhere else, like other data, which we, on which we have the ground truth. And we apply that model to this data. And then the, the results can be kind of um, bad, right? But then we want to highlight the place where we think the model is making mistake, ask human to verify it, right? So this is a basic idea. In general, you want to iteratively solicit human to input to improve the model uh, and eventually converge to a good quality result. But the question is, where do we want to show them uh, the human, right? Um, human, uh, where, to, where do they have to do the annotation? So the idea is do we want to find the branch or the structure that the model is the least certain, right? So this is a general principle that applies to a lot of existing approach. The question, so in, uh, the question is uh, how, how do you do it, right? So that actually uh, leads us to the concept of uncertainty and, and topological uncertainty. So what is uncertainty? Um, uncertainty basically sort of, uh, just like the likelihood function we talked about earlier, right? When your network is making a prediction, not only do, does it need to predict, but also we would like to know how confident it is, right? So for example, here the network is making a prediction, this is a plane, but if by just looking at the field, uh, the view, you will realize it's only seeing a very small part of the uh, airplane. So, so even if you're making a prediction, it should not be that confident, right? So this actually um, is, um, so in fact, the neural network itself has a continuous valued prediction. Um, they are usually the last layer of the neural network right before the thresholding. Um, and uh, we, a lot of people can actually just extract, directly extract that continuous value and say, okay, this is my confidence, right? But turns out in practice, this number is often overconfident. So we, we also, uh, we often make the uh, network, uh, make a, it's always either close to zero or close to one. It's not that informative. So on this side, we had on uh, separate works uh, focusing on the uncertainty less relevant to topology uh, that um, by my student Chen Li and others. And this is totally another talk. I'm not talking about it today. Um, and in general, when people do this um, uncertainty estimation, one idea, one common principle is if you can sample a bunch of models or you can jointly train a distribution of models, and then you just sample several of them, for each of them, you make a prediction and then you average the predictions out. Right? That's a ensemble principle. And this is actually applied and implemented. One is called M, uh, Monte Carlo dropout. Um, the idea is we take, um, sorry, just one second. Very sorry for the interruption. Um, the hotel is cleaning. Hopefully the noise is not very bad. Um, so a very famous one is called the Monte Carlo dropout. Um, the idea of a Monte Carlo dropout is to take a uh, sample. Uh, when you train the neural network, you have a random uh, probability to just knock out some neurons and their connections. And then, um, and then you learn by, after training at the test time, you can randomly sample those networks and then just take their ensemble to, 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 to come out with the results. 
Um, and then this um, there are a lot of variations of it. People implement in different ways and uh, in terms of computation, in terms of quality. Now, these are good in terms of prediction, um, but now we're coming back to uh, the segmentation problem. At segmentation problem, the challenge is we're not just making predictions at every data independently. Instead, we are looking at the whole image and we're actually making a joint classification on every pixel in the image, right? And they're related, right? They can't be treated independently. So on this context, one of the uh, uh, early methods that are uh, really um, kind of famous is um, a probabilistic unit, right? Extension of unit. The idea is if you can learn to sample different segmentations of the same object, here is a long nodule, and then you can see the different segmentations. Some of them are even nothing. Some of them is a little bit bigger and so forth. If you have a bunch of those segmentations, you can just overlay them. And then you could see a, 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 a intensity function a map that is could be the uncertainty of segmentation. If you, in this case, I don't have the actual overlaid image, but if you overlay them, you can see the core in the core of the nodule, it will be very white, right? And then outside near the boundary of the image, the whole thing is com completely black. So the network is very confident, but near the boundary, the network will be like a little bit gray, right? So the uh, it could either be the part of the nodule or not. Um, so this is good. So we tried it on our uh, vessel segmentation task, right? So the issue comes in. If we actually do the segmentation and look at the likelihood function, this is a, uh, look at the uncertainty function. And this is a, one of the uh, latest uncertainty, uncertainty um, map generated by a new mess, newer method, but it's a variation of those um, the, the earlier uh, method. Uh, you can see the issue is, if we look at those, even those very thick structures, near the boundary of those thick structures, we get very uncertain pixels. And that makes sense because those pixels just between vessel and background, of course, the network is kind of uncertain, right? It's half, it's half, half, right? But this is not helpful to us, right? When we want to get a user to help us, we want the user to look at each individual structures and tell, tell us this one, I'm certain, uh, uh, we, we, we can identify the structures that are uncertain and ask the user to help. That's the most efficient way to use their knowledge, right? There's no point refining a very thick vessel, right? So how do we get this kind of uncertainty instead of this kind of uncertainty? That is what we're trying to do now. Then, then we come to the tool we're using. Uh, instead of using person homology, we actually are using person homology, but we're focusing on using this discrete mode theory. In particular, discrete mode theory and in general mode theory is trying to extract those uh, manifold manifold structures um, that connects uh, uh, critical points. And then they actually follow exactly the landscape of the um, input functions. I mean, it could be intensive function. Uh, in our case, it's just a likelihood function. For example, the most complex in this case intuitively is basically the saddle points, uh, local maximums, and then their stable manifold, really just the mountain ridge connecting them, right? Uh, in general, this is more like a singularities of gradient field of the, uh, the gradient field, um, but we're using this as a structural representation of the underlying data, right? They can, they actually is a superset of the information we have in terms of person homology and generators, not necessarily the optimal generators, but generators. Um, in principle, if we have the most complex, we could actually compute persistence uh, completely, right? And then, um, so here's just a close look up, right? So we have likelihood function. If you do segmentation, this is the result. And then with uh, discrete most complex, we basically have all the critical points and then the path is connecting them. You can see this structure basically contains the, the, um, the, the branching uh, structure, even the part where the segmentation wouldn't be able to see because it's too weak, right? So with this in mind, uh, we basically come to our, um, uh, the first solution, which was published this year in uh, iClear 2023. Um, uh, it was uh, selected as Spotlight presentation. Um, the idea of this um, this work um, was 
instead of we start by the input image and then extract the likelihood function. Then we use discrete most complex to generate all the structures, right? But notice that in this space of all structures, we end up could be uh, exponentially huge, right? Every every uh, uh, stable manifold connecting a saddle point and the uh, the uh, maximum could be part could be either belonging to the structure or not, right? So we basically have two to the power of n many possibility combinations. So instead of doing this, we do some kind of pruning of the structural space. The idea is actually every of those structures actually can become can have its own persistent homology, uh, persistence. Sorry. Then we basically have a scalar value for every of those structures. We can then sort all those structures according to the persistence. And then we actually learn a Gaussian distribution over that space, uh, a one, time, one parameter Gaussian distribution. And then that parameter distribution basically tells us the probability distribution of all those structures, whether they belong to the true, uh, true structure or not. And then with this, we can basically sample different uh, epsilons or different persistence and using that to give us one structure. And then we basically have a, a collection of them and then overlay them that give us the uncertainty map. Right. This is for earlier work. I mean, this is published this year, but it's already earlier work for, for us. Um, um, another student, uh, Soumya, um, has been trying to extend this work to uh, so that we um, we do not have to do such as one parameter family. So as in practice, we found out this using persistence uh, to do the one parameter meter, uh, family filtering. The distribution of persistent values over the structures are somehow by model, right? Some of them has very high persistence, others have very low persistence. In some sense, it doesn't actually follow a, a Gaussian distribution. And then if we try to model it with single param uh, one uh, unimodal Gaussian distribution, it's kind of, it's too, it's not actually uh, good enough. So instead what we do is we, I mean, this figure is a little bit too complicated. The idea is we extract all the different structures for, we try to make a joint inference over all the structures. Each of them, we try to predict whether it's true or not. And meanwhile, we reason about the uncertainty of it, okay? So there are two components. One is we want to inject um, uncertainty or inject randomness into even the extraction of the structures. Another one is how do we do the joint inference, okay? So the first thing is about joint inference. The idea is kind of straightforward. They, we, take, uh, we take the uh, moss skeleton, and then every structure is a MOS structure, uh, or, or uh, a stable manifold. And then we abstract it as a node in a graph. And we connect two nodes if they share these two structures are connected, right? So we basically construct the graph. And then we can translate this into a graph neural network problem, where we, at every node, we're trying to predict whether this node or the corresponding structure of this node is a true structure or not. We have ground truths. We just compare the structure with the ground truth to know whether this structure, how close this structure is to the ground truth. And then we, this is directly already a, a, a joint prediction problem. And then meanwhile, we can inject this uncertainty reasoning framework into this, right? The loss itself is not uh, new. Um, here, basically for every, um, this loss, uh, aside from trying to make sure the prediction is cl close enough to the true, uh, true probability, Meanwhile, we add um, this uncertainty S. We try to estimate the uncertainty for every edge. Um, this uncertainty, you can see, if the uncertainty, um, when we set the uncertainty very large, right, then the exponential of the uncertainty will make the loss, the accuracy, that not that important, right? The first term, basically, no matter how far your prediction is from the ground truth, if you have very large uncertainty, this whole thing is very close to zero anyway. It doesn't matter. But meanwhile, you pay penalty uh, with this ad additional term uh, saying the uncertainty is large, then the loss is large anyway. But if your uncertainty is small, so you don't pay actual penalty, but then this difference is mag magnified. So your, your prediction has to be very accurate, right? So this mechanism help us to jointly estimate uncertainty for every node or every structure and make prediction. Um, that only talks about how do we do the joint inference Another um, relevant information we are having is where we had the question of that when we actually extract the structures, right? We actually use a very deterministic path connecting the 
uh, saddle point and local maximum. Is this really the right choice? Like for example, this is actually, um, this is the ground truth and this is the, the deterministic DMT gives us, right? So we feel like if you look at the an actual underlying, you would realize the structure could be anywhere around this um, gray area, right? So instead of doing this, we inject some kind of randomness by, uh, by doing a little bit of random work along the direction. Um, and then the details are, uh, are skipped um, and we, we admit this kind of a heuristic idea, but fundamentally we try to sample different paths and then these, these different paths that basically give us um, a, a variation of those structures, the same structure. And during training, during training, when we do, when we feed those structures into the graph neural network, we actually, each time we sample different of those variations. And then once we have the very structure extracted and we take the likelihood function and the original image, these three together using convolution eventually give us, we can use this to generate a feature for this structure that we is fitted into, fed into this neural network node. And then of course, we also use the additional value like the persistence of this structure to help us to eventually get the whole representation of this structure. And combining all those things, and then eventually here's the results. I'm skipping all the quantitative results. Uh, you just believe me because we published, uh, we, we put this in the paper, that means we actually have good numbers. Um, and then um, there are different var validation methods of metrics to evaluate those quantity. Um, but here quantitative, you can see this is a retinal vessel and this is also a vessel uh, images and traditional pixel wise uncertainty is just like what we said earlier. They're not very informative. And then here's uh, the earlier work by Xiaoling and here's a newer work by uh, Somia. You can see all these structures are very well um, identified, especially the green ones are the one in which the segmentation model unit actually missed them, right? They are missed and then our model basically highlight those uncertain structures saying, um, if we look closely, we realize the segmentation is just not good enough, right? So it correctly identified errors of the neural network uh, segmentation. Now on the bottom is 3D vasculature structures. We can see the uncertainty actually give us a very good highlight, highlight of especially the, the thin structures, uh, which ones are uncertain, which ones are not. Um, so having said that, uh, we come back to the uncertain, uh, the future work. Uh, uh, how do we move forward with uncertainty? Actually, I, I'm sneaking in a little bit more uh, introduction of the generative model as well. It's relevant. So looking forward, um, so I, I, my title is uh, topologic uncertainty and the representation. And I was just talking about uncertainty itself, right? So representation um, in, 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 in deep learning or in machine learning nowadays, uh, the word of representation is really abused, right? So basically um, the general idea of representation means you have some object or some input, how do we convert it into some kind of feature vector? And that feature vector is can be very power, can be informative enough for you to do to do a prediction based on right. So here the idea is we want to in general uh, to me we topological methods is not just some features. It's not something we just just a loss. In general, we want to combine them with deep neural network. Fundamentally, they provide us some tools uh, to extract some kind of structural hypothesis. I will talk a little bit about more about this later. So the idea is if we have those structural hypotheses, they don't have to be true. But the point is when we actually do learning, we can learn on, on top of this kind of structure pieces as units rather than um, originally uh, taking every pixels and so forth. And then beyond uncertainty, there are a lot of things we can do. This framework of extracting structures, decomposing them into pieces can be used in a lot in terms of reasoning about the structures and talking about their representations, and, and we can also use them for generative models, for example. And then of course, these uncertainty and representations can be used for downstream analysis, right? Even can we sub them, can we um, use them to improve our robustness of downstream analysis um, and so forth. And some of our earlier work we had uh, on topolo topological generator, uh, where we uh, try to generate those fine scale structures and meanwhile, we try to enforce the generative result to have the right topology uh, as a uh, true image use. Um, and then uh, a recent work in this year, in 2023 uh, uh, CPR, we try to do this in a, uh, in a cell, um, cells, uh, cell 
uh, cellular architecture of uh, pathology images where we try to generate. So here's the original image and here are the cells and the colors correspond to different type of cells. We want to generate new images that have a similar uh, spatial distribution of those cells, how they're mixed, whether they have the right structures and gaps between them. These are uh, the re really relevant things we want to be able to learn. And this is, um, this is done, um, we have done this not only by a person homology, but also we actually look at the holes and generators and try to match the generators as well. Um, so these generative models could also use this representation. Uh, and then finally, I just want to come back to my two stories, right? So the top top row is uh, how the tools I'm using have been evolving. I use person homology to start with, and then I start to look closer to the generators of those homologies. Uh, and then uh, um, eventually I actually looking at the most complex that breaks the uh, breaks the holes into pieces um, and those pieces combined will give us the holes, right? The, 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 the homology. Uh, not that the earlier things, the, the diagrams are not useful, but they need to be combined all together to give a better sense in practice, right? Then in the imaging processing tasks, you can see things are evolving. In the beginning, we true we just take the image as the intensity as uh, as a signal, try to do a thresholding, and then turns out using person homology and generators, we can actually identify the part where the thresholding is not good enough, especially where the signal is weak. So things are broken, we fix them, right? But later on, we, we incorporate deep learning into this, where deep learning sort of give us a way to pre-process the image, to give us good signals, the likelihood function is literally considered, can literally be considered as a substitute of the intensity function, then you can use topology to reason about it, to directly make a, to help you to, to reason about the segmentation, train the network. And finally, the, the requirement is even higher, even, uh, even be, beyond the segmentation itself, can you actually give us some more information about the neural network, about the prediction, like uncertainty, and that, personal homology and topology, and in general, this structural hypothesis can really be helpful, right? Overall, we, in, in my view, like we start, I start by talking about topology, homology, but in general, I think we're like topology is a tool to help us actually extract and reason about structures. And these structures, of course, if you look at generators and critical points, in general, it was believed that it is not stable with regard to perturbation of the input function. That's fine. But in practice, right? So this is actually a good thing, in my opinion. If the structure is true, it is highly stable. If it is, if a structure is not stable, it actually means the structure is less likely to be, to be true, right? So it's actually very good information for us to use. And then this structural hypothesis can be extremely useful and combine into um, various different learning, downstream learning tasks. Um, and then finally, I want to thank my, two of my students uh, for carrying out the two main works I'm mentioning. Of course, a lot of other works are done by my other students, uh, Xiaoling, who just graduated, and then um, and Saumia, a uh, second year student, and she has done a lot, actually third, third year now. Uh, she has done a lot of work uh, in this direction. And here are the references, and also uh, um, uh, I also thank the funding uh, resource. That's the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's all unmute briefly and uh, clap for, for Charles' great talk. Thank you. All right. So do we have any public questions? We had one in the chat. I'm, I'm going to ask it for you. So uh, this was asked by Stephen Ellis. Uh, it's about how do you get to the ground truth? I think this is a is a question that that was set in the, for the second part of your talk, but I think it can can apply to, uh, to to the overall question. Yes. So, in general, uh, when you train a segmentation models methods, um, you assume uh during training, uh, you have this ground truth for every image. Okay. Uh, this ground truth is basically the same size as the input image. Every pixel is a binary. I mean, it could be multiple labels, but here every pixel is just a binary uh, label, either zero or one, meaning whether this location belongs to the structure or not. For example, in this case, the structure we care about is the boundary of neurons. And for this case, the structure are the road 
of this from the satellite image. This image, its a structure is literally the, the cracks of the uh, image. And then in the, um, uh, in the later on, this kind of uh, 3D vasculature, it's actually 3D voxels, different locations, every location, whether it belongs to the vasculature or not, or the background. Um, this kind of ma binary mask um, you can acquire by manual labels. What does that mean? You show the image to an expert, you provide the right tools, they basically tells you every pixel, every vo voxel, whether it's true or not, belong to the true structure or not. Um, is that clear enough, Stephen? Yes, I thought you the, you wanted to extract the most critical or um, uncertain structures and have the expert look at those, but it sounds like the expert has to look at everything in order to create the ground so, truth image. Okay. So that's a good question. So in some sense, in the first step, in the original setting, we do hope we have all the ground truths. But in practice, we can never have that because it's super expensive to do this. So the idea is we iteratively ask the user, we somehow ask user model to predict the structures partially, and then ask the user to, to correct them when they are wrong, right? So somehow we try to make the labeling process semi-automatic. And that is actually the whole motivation of this work. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so for example, in the beginning, we have some images have the full annotation. And later on, we hope, and we have a lot of images that are not labeled. And then we slowly correct those labels on those unlabeled image. And eventually we sort of believe, although none of them are fully annotated by the human, but we believe they are good enough. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second question in the chat, Matt. Uh, yes, I was going to ask that. Also, feel free to unmute if you want to ask that yourself, Matt. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so on the... I, I, I saw the MC dropout slide, and uh, I'm, I'm familiar with dropout. And, uh, I'm familiar with ensemble methods, but I was I was wondering if you encountered any computational bottlenecks in um, sort of using either the dropout or you mentioned you had a random walk sort of process. Um, sort of what what computational bottlenecks did you have in terms of utilizing? Uh, the topological tools that you mentioned? Was it like diagram generation? Was it generating the Morse complex? Or or was it actually on the image segmentation side? What, um, yeah, yes. well, where is the main complexity, I guess? Yeah. So, so I think what you're talking about has several different things. The one is about dropout. Um, that's yeah. already, that like a dropout by default is very well, um, um, it's, it's a good technique and it's very efficient. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, but in terms of topology computation, uh, your your guess is correct. The computation of discrete most complex in general is very expensive. Um, and I mean, it's not that expensive when we compare to computing person homology in some sense, right? Um, in, at least in imaging side, if we talk about in the normal sense, a couple of seconds or something, that's fine. But if you imagine you want to redo this uh, repeatedly during neural network training on every training image, and then it's just not enough. So yes, it is a bottleneck. I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah. Um, and also random work, you're right. Random work itself also takes time. Um, and um, um, uh, so I'm done with the question. Or do you have uh, more concerns, Matt? No, I guess uh, the... It's a little blurry to me how you go from you. You have a lot of different uh, approaches that involve sampling, basically, uh, for yeah. for the uncertainty estimation. So, so it's a little blurry to me. You know what? What? Where you go from? Uh, what? What is being generated for each sample? Is is a Morse complex being generated for each sample? Um, initially, we use deterministic to generate a Morse complex, and then. The first run can give us the pairing of critical points, right? And the original most complex can only give us a connection path connecting every every two paired critical points, but we don't trust that fully, right? So for every pair of connect uh, every pair of critical points, we generate random passes connecting them. That randomness is 
like there's randomness, but also we follow in general the intensity function or likelihood function between them. So, so we sample variations of them. And then I with see. different variations, we sit, we feed them into the neural network training and feature generation. I hope that makes sense. I see. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, Songki has, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, generative model. Um, so it depends on which way you're talking about generative. So the, uh, the uncertainty work and the semi-supervised learning, or, uh, this, this part has no, uh, generative model in it at this moment. Um, we do that random work based the sampling of variation of structures, but it's just a sampling in some sense. Um, and then uh, it's not actually a sampling, to be honest, right? We don't have a distribution yet. Um, so the the generative component, a generative model is completely a separate work in which we try to, uh, let me just go to the slides. So this is basically, the first work is uh, a GAN model. In this GAN model, uh, we basically, the training are a lot of images and we are actually not even trying to generate the real, like uh, we can always generate to the real uh, images, but we're taking all the binary images and use them as the training data. And then eventually we generate also, we learn to generate also binary images that has similar topology as ground truth, um, and, but they're supposed to be different. And then in this work, we are, the input are a collection of different um, point clouds, basically, multi-class point cloud. And then we basically try to look at this distribution of point clouds and try to learn to generate, uh, any, uh, this is a conditional generator. We take a, any conditional uh, point cloud, we try to generate another point cloud that has similar distribution of points of classes and of mixing and also of structures like the gaps and, and, and holes and things like that. Then I'll answer your question, Songki. Yes, thank you for your comment. Yep. yep, thank you. Um, the next question, uh, Nathan, do you use uh sample layer in Python to calculate the bottom of the waste of water stain distance? Are there other tools you have found useful for calculating this loss? Um, yes. So actually, my student Xiaoling, if you go to his website, he has a very convenient topo loss. Uh, Python module, you can directly incorporate them into your segmentation model. Um, and that's actually supposed to be very efficient uh, in practice. A lot of people have been using it. Um, we can, um, I think we just, if you don't know where it is, uh, just reach out to us. We will provide all these things. We've been using this on different contexts um, in, um, in different uh, imaging segmentation contexts, and it's been uh, useful enough, uh, sufficient, uh, efficient enough. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's uh, great. Thank you very much. No problem. Any more questions from uh, the audience? Yeah. Yes. We can also move to a non-public question section. So if, if there are no, uh, if there are no public questions anymore, I um, can also uh, stop the recording and move to the private questions. Maybe I would have one last question. Yeah. Uh, namely, I was thinking about that slide where you had the um, this many pictures about vascular um, ground roof, but also your method of uncertainty. Um, and sorry, just try to understand yeah. which one you're talking about. <laughs> sorry, I didn't describe it very well. The one with uh, 2D and I, 3D. Uh, uh, early on, later on. I had too many pictures. Uh, uh, later, I think. Oh, the validation, uh, the uh, the qualification. OK. Yeah, Is this, this one. one? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, this one. Exactly, okay. because um, there one can see that in your, uh, the method that you say, our method, um, mm -hmm. the some sometimes there are features that the ground roof has as kind of disconnected components mm -hmm. and um, you have it as connected to the main branch. So that looks like maybe your yours is even better than the ground roof because it seems re realistic that these things should be connected. So, so what I mean, for example, is the second mm -hmm. um, row, there are in the ground roof quite some disconnected pieces. 
Yes. And then in your method, it actually gets connected to the rest. I think here we're okay. So, so there are two things I want to mention. First of all, in 2D image, connected doesn't necessarily be correct. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you think about it, it's a 3D structure, right? It's possible the structure is below the slice, connected yeah. through the below slice. So it doesn't have to be connected in the, on the slice. And another thing, so in that sense, it's not necessarily true that our results are better. Uh, here, I think the main focus is to visualize that there's some missing piece, um, but not necessarily we are connected, so we are better, correct, more correct. Uh, another thing is here, I think we implicitly try to incorporate a connectivity prior. Um, that's not necessarily truly for uh, reflecting what's happening with the 2D. It may or may not be true in some case, cases. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's what I want to say. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. For three D, yes. In general, you could assume things are connected. Everything's right. Nice. We have another question just coming up. So, have you done any work in three D reconstruction, or mostly in the two D space for now? Oh, three D. Um, um, we validate on two D, but we uh, the framework is done fully. Uh, most of the work are on three D. And now we'll work on 3D uh, vasculature structures um, and so forth. Very nice. Thank you so much. I also have a, um, um, a broader question about the, the results that you mentioned in passing, maybe. Um, are, you, are you still working also on detecting these intrusions into, into machine learning systems? So the, I remember that you also had some work combining topology with um, uh, detecting uh, networks that have been tampered with or adversarial uh, samples, right? Yes. Uh, so that goes to the, um, so, okay. Um, that goes to this work. We had a uh, Neurip mm -hmm. 2021 work in which we look at correlation matrix between uh, neural activations and then the high persistent loops of those correlations actually indicate the intrusion, uh, a backdoor attack of neural network. It's not intrusion of adversarial uh, attack. It's actually a backdoor attack. So the model was mm -hmm. pre-poisoned uh, beforehand. Um, mm -hmm. I only cited two papers along this line uh, that are closely relevant topology. I'm still working on those papers, uh, working on this project. We actually have more papers published recently, focusing more, uh, moving uh, towards more NLP models um, um, with uh, like transformers, how do you detect mm -hmm. those? How do we even attack those things? Uh, I was, uh, and also how do we mitigate with knowledge utilization? They are published in uh, recent years as well. I'd be happy to provide the reference. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, I want to comment a little bit about this, right? So the challenge in this context is the data when the model gets really complex, mm -hmm. um, the, the topological signal gets less easy to detect. So, so we, yes. we, we, hit, we hit a wall at some point uh, in between mm -hmm. 21, 22. Um, and then now uh, we are a little bit more, um, we are a little bit more focusing on some local, two ways. One is localized the way to identify the, um, the unnatural neurons uh, mm -hmm. or something. Um, and uh, um, or uh, some unnatural, uh, some unnatural neurons, or the uh, the um, the overall way of some kind of uh, knowledge distillation way uh, to uh, to wash out the unnatural in attacks. Mm -hmm. um, but we couldn't find a very consistent and scalable model. Uh, that can use the topology to consistently identify the topology issues, uh, the, the the attack issues, let me put it now. <laughs> you are welcome. I mean, if you want to, I can totally provide, uh, this, this kind of research are totally open. I can totally provide all the data and even the poison models for you to play with if you want to. Um, and then- be interesting. My, yeah, just, just reach out and my students can provide you all the training data, training model. Uh, with the latest uh, like attacks and all kind of things, it's just a matter of how many, how much of them do you need. Um, but then you can make, you can try to make sense of it. Um, it's up to you. It's yeah, there are very interesting questions to 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 investigate. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you. This is very interesting. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
Very exciting. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, we are approaching the hour. So are there any more public questions? If not, I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, everyone.